never know where those social tipping points are. And we could wake up in a week or a month and find ourselves on the brink of something really new and exciting. And, um, you know, if each of us in this field and in, in all fields can do, uh, can do our small part to, to get to that point, um, that's something that, that's really worth getting up for in the morning. My name's Ken Bagstad. I'm currently working as a postdoc here at the Gund. I got my PhD here. So I'm working with the U.S. Geological Survey, which acts as a scientific advisory agency to the Department of Interior, which means that we get to work with uh, various other agencies, including the Bureau of Land Management, the Fish and Wildlife Service, the National Park Service. And the exciting thing about that is that we get to provide some scientific capacity for some of those agencies and also get a little bit into, um, into some policy guidance for, for some of the agencies that are managing um, big chunks of this country's land and this country's natural resources. So uh, it's a really exciting position to be in. We're starting to help develop guidance for how the BLM can account for ecosystem services in its decision-making process. Ecosystem services, you'll get slightly different answers whoever you talk to, of course, but um, they're the basic processes that go on in nature that um, sustain people and the, the other species that we depend on, from the trees we harvest for, uh, for timber and paper, to the fish in the ocean, to, the, uh, to our agriculture and our livestock. Um, they're the things that underpin our whole economy. So the challenge right now, as we know, there's 6.8 billion people on the planet uh, with projections that there could be as many as 9 billion people on the planet. And for those of us in developed countries, like here in the United States, uh, we have this vague idea that we're connected to, the, to nature as a society, but um, in a lot of cases, uh, people don't have a full understanding of where their food comes from, where their water comes from their real dependence on ecosystems. We get cases like natural disasters and the, the value of coastal ecosystems and protecting us from hurricanes and other disasters, things like that, are becoming more evident in this country too. Um, so it comes back to this idea that natural capital used to be something that was free and we thought was limitless and what we needed to do um, was have more people and more capital to exploit it. And now we're realizing that in fact, it's nature that's scarce given uh, the, the size of our population and our, our demands for, um, for things out of the environment. Um, so we, we really need to start turning that on its head and using our natural capital more smartly. Some of the tools we're building uh, are trying to really improve how we visualize that and how we make decisions. So to look at places where people depend on ecosystems and places where they're provided and start to draw those links and to develop ways for, for citizens and decision makers to, um, to really map out those connections and try to understand it better. And what we're trying to do is figure out more rigorous ways to transfer those values, as it's called. So accounting for um, making sure that we have similar environmental conditions in the places where we're transferring values for and also similar socioeconomic conditions and human preferences when we transfer those values. Um, so that's a, that's a method called value transfer which is being used in environmental and ecological economics. And um, one of the things we're adding to that is looking at the actual physical flows of ecosystem services. And this is something where if we know that a certain human population is getting certain benefits from another place and that this is the strength of the connection between the two, we could try to use that as a criteria for how strongly they value um, that resource based on studies in other places where we know that there's a connection that's not that strong or that's slightly stronger, for instance. How we take this imperfect state of the information out there about environmental values and we turn that into something that's useful for decision making when decision makers want uh, hard, precise numbers that they can compare to um, more traditional economic analyses where we do have decades and decades worth of good, sharp records, how we, how we compare the environmental side of the ledger there uh, when we don't have as strong a history of, um, of valuing the environment. That's a, that's a really big challenge. Like any good economist, you argue things on the one hand, you make this argument, on the other hand, you make that argument. Um, it's a common complaint about economists, but um, I've been arguing that we need to attach a dollar value to these ecosystem services. 
on the other hand, they really are priceless and they're something we depend on. And um, if nature disappeared tomorrow, um, people would disappear in pretty short order. So it's something that we just have to understand how dependent we are and how we need to, we need to manage things better. And that's a, that's a growing awareness, but um, I think it's something that everybody needs to know. And if we all, if tomorrow we all woke up and we understood that um, right, left, conservative, uh, liberal um, in the developed world and the developing world, uh, I think we'd make our economic choices look a lot different. And I think we'd, we'd be on a better path uh, as a society. So that's, that's where we ought to be. And that's what I hope that all of our work can help contribute toward.